You know, I knew that when I said Mark of the Beast, everybody would show up. Now, we're going to have people walking through here, so just be aware of that, just make way. But this is the perfect place to give this particular little talk. Um, first of all, you know these verses. It says, uh, uh, talking about the, um, the image of the beast, and it was allowed to give breath to the image, the false prophet. Uh, in Revelation chapter 13, by the way, verse 15. Um, uh, this image that comes to life. It was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that it could give, uh, so that the image of the beast might uh, even speak and might cause those who would not, listen, might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. It also, uh, also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both slave and free, to be marked on their right hand or their forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now, I'm not going to talk about the 666 part. Uh, I know you were wishing I probably would, like we all would, because what is that? Well, you can flip a coin on that. People have a lot of ideas. But first of all, the story starts in Ezekiel chapter 9, when you have Judah about to go into captivity during you know, ba the siege of Babylon, and Ezekiel has this vision of these angels, one of whom is a scribe, and he's told by the Lord, say to the angel who's a scribe, go and put a mark on anyone who is weeping over the condition of Jerusalem, which was bad. They had fallen back into idolatry. They're also presuming that it was no big deal. Babylon's going to take us, but we'll be back. And they were kind of shrugging it all off because, I mean, times were like that. They could, you know, they would encounter disasters and bounce back from it. But Ezekiel said, you know, the Lord's telling Ezekiel, no, that's not the way it works. Put a mark on everyone who is weeping over the condition. In other words, the righteous, the good, the people that know we have done wrong. They're going to go into captivity too, but they're going to be preserved. So they get a mark on their forehead. And the mark, of course, if you read it in the Hebrew, is Tav. T-A-W, or we would pronounce it Tav with a V. Which in those days, interestingly enough, looked like a cross. Uh, now it's evolved into something else as the language of the alphabet has evolved. Now, you have another group of people. This is the next mark that you see that shows up in the book of Revelation. And that's a mark that's put on the 144,000. So 12,000 from each tribe, male, virgin, Jews, and they're marked so that even though they're in the tribulation, they cannot be harmed. This is pointing back to Ezekiel. That's the reference. So just like the people who would go into captivity with a mark, they're going into captivity, but they can't be harmed. The 144,000 are going into the tribulation, but they cannot be harmed. Because why? They're righteous. They're Jews. And again, we could assume that they weren't messianic until that moment because they're in the tribulation and they get marked so that they can't be harmed. So here comes the counterfeit mark by the Antichrist. And when he said, you know, the, the image speaks, they get, you know, the false prophet gives power to the image of the Antichrist and he speaks and nobody, you know, everybody who refuses a mark will be killed or if you don't have the mark, nobody will buy or sell from you. Now, we look at that and we say, I wonder what that is. The people here knew... In fact, the people of this region knew, everywhere. There was a problem that they had here called Caesar worship. Now, Caesar worship bound the empire together. De Lakes mentioned it before. Some of you heard this before, but let me take it a few extra steps. Caesar worship started with Augustus. When Augustus died, some oracle happened to mention, I saw his soul ascend up into the heaven among the gods. So Augustus would be among the gods. That's why Caesar is declared as divine. He's not really a god. He's with the gods, among the gods. And every Caesar after that took advantage of the idea because you have this empire that conquered this vast region, uh, Africa, North Africa, and, and parts of Asia, and of course Europe, and way up into the Germanic areas. Everybody had their own gods that they worshipped. And they were all regional gods. When you changed regions, you paid homage to those gods. Have you ever wondered why the children of Israel had such a problem with idolatry? Whenever they moved into a land, you find them starting to move towards worshiping the gods of that land. That's why they did it, because they, they were in captive in, uh, in Egyptian, you know, it's I, idol Grand Central. 
and they're in Egypt. That's the way it was. Now they moved out from under the gods of Egypt. Well, they worship God. Yes, they do. But remember, these are people that live in a world where you worship the gods of the lands that you move into to make sure that you have their favor and that you also have the favor of the people who live in the land. That's why they had a problem with idolatry. It took God 1,200 years after the Exodus to work that out of them, and he finally did when they came back from the Babylonian exile. Pretty much all of that's gone. 1,200 years. I mean, wow, that's amazing. But God did it. Well, here comes Rome. Rome captures this entire empire, including Judea. And they, of course, expect you now to worship the emperor. And they do this for a reason. It causes a cohesion, a religious cohesion in the empire. In order to have a really stable empire, you've got to have a strong leader, you have to have a strong capital, and you have to have a common religion or a common belief. Well, you have all these people worshiping all these different gods. You can imagine how different the gods of Egypt were from the gods of the Celts. Very, very different on opposite ends of the empire. But they had one god in common. Here's the divine Caesar, starting with Augustus. And then you'll find, when we're at Pergamum, you'll see this amazing ruin of this temple, the temple to Trajan, the god Trajan and all of that. And so you would worship that emperor. And all you had to do was take a pinch of incense once a year, go to the temple, and as DeLake had said, you burn that pinch of incense and say, Caesar is Lord. And then they would issue you a certificate of some sort, probably written on a broken pottery shard or scratched into a piece of wood, but either way, it was official that you had done this, and now you are a loyal subject to the empire. But more than that, you see, the people in this area, because they were idolatrous, believed that if you didn't treat the god right, things would come back on you. Caesar was a god. The Jews were not commanded to worship Caesar because they protested, we only worship one god, there are no other gods, there is no other divinity that we worship. So Rome gives them a pass, and they're the only ones in the empire that don't have to worship a god, a Caesar as a god. They're the only ones. Here come the Christians. Well, they're associated with the Jews. Rome doesn't know anything about what the Jews believe, not really. All they know is that here's this messianic group that's somehow associated with the Jews, and, well, they get the same pass. They don't have to worship uh, Caesar until they discover that the Christians worship, now, in their minds, not our minds, their minds, they worship a second god, Jesus. Ah, if they can worship two gods, they can worship three. They have to worship Caesar. And they won't do it. The pagans get mad because they won't worship the pagan gods of the land, whether they're coming or going or staying in place, because if they don't worship the pagan gods right, then there's a famine, there's a flood, there's a fire, there's an earthquake, there's an invasion, there's something that happens. And who gets the blame? The ones who didn't worship the god right. But then you got Caesar, and that takes it up a whole other level. If the Christians won't burn a pinch of incense to Caesar and say Caesar is Lord, then they incur not only the wrath of Rome, but the wrath of the public, because they are now disloyal. They are traitors to the empire. They are not patriotic. And here's how you need to picture it. You ready? It's like taking a knee. You know, at our football games, all of that. It's like that sort of an effect where you say, you know, whether you believe in the cause or not behind what Colin Kaepernick was doing, you look at that whole thing and you say, man, that makes me mad because I honor our flag, I honor our country. It's like that whole rebellion against being patriotic in any way that's happening in our country. And if you're at all conservative in your patriotism, that really, really offends you, doesn't it? It makes your blood boil, it gets your adrenaline up, right? Same thing. Except these folks could be really violent about it, as you'll note when we get to the theater and we rehearse that story there. But needless to say, the Christians wouldn't worship Caesar. And this is what they got persecuted for. This is how they were persecuted. Now, there's a much larger story to that, and we'll be able to talk about bits and pieces of that as we go. But here's the big deal. On a daily basis, People had to do shopping and, you know, you have to get vegetables, you have to sell things in order to stay afloat and keep alive and eat and all of that. So, 
Here you are in Ephesus, and you have these monumental arches here coming into the Segura. Of course, this would be a place where you would have public meetings. You would have uh, vendors here, people selling and buying things here. And you would have other entrances, too, that would be similar to this one. But the reason we're standing here is because of this niche right here and right here. What would be standing in these niches here would be a statue of a Roman emperor maybe different Roman emperors. Take your pick, they're all divine. Even the living one, you know, you can do even Domitian when he was here. And when you're coming into the Agora, you're coming in to do one of two things. You're coming in to buy something, or you're coming in to sell something. Now it's starting to ring, isn't it? As you come through, there's gonna be a real bored priest sitting probably right about where I am or somewhere right around here, who is watching every person come in. In front of the statue, there's a little pan with charcoal, and there's another bowl with some spices in it, <coughs> some incense. And as you came in to go in to buy or sell anything, you would take that pinch of incense and throw it onto the charcoal, creating a sense of worship. This is how you worshipped these emperors. And you would say to the priest, may the luck of Caesar be with you. And the priest would nod, and then you go and you buy or sell things, and that's it. You're a Christian. Are you going to do that? Not a chance. So you come in, you walk right past, and the priest says, excuse me, you forgot something. And the Christian says, I'm a Christian, I can't do that. And the priest says, do it. And you say, I can't do that. But you're disloyal to the empire, and it gets louder and perhaps more raucous. And then if you refuse and you just keep right on going, the priest follows you shouting, this man will not worship the god Caesar. And when he goes in here, if he's trying to sell something, nobody will buy from him. If he's trying to buy something, nobody will sell from him. When they read that passage in the book of Revelation, which came to this city, and the people read it here, they got it. That's what they knew. What's the sixth six thing, six thing about? That's a whole other discussion, and we still have some questions about that. But what we do know is that the mark of the beast, if you're saying, well, I wonder if it's a subdermal microchip, I wonder if it's going to be a tattoo, what's it going to be? You know, that's not the important point. You say, well, yes it is, well, you're not going to be here for that, so what are you worried about, right? That's not the important point. The important point that's being made here is that at that time, it's who you worship. And during the tribulation, when this takes place, and that happens right about the middle of the tribulation, when this takes place, the people are now forced to worship the Antichrist. And if you don't, people will say, your mark of loyalty, whatever that is, that you're not worshiping him, then we'll either kill you, or we won't buy anything from you, or we won't sell anything to you. We will starve you into submission, or we'll kill you. That's the mark of the beast as it stood back then. Why the right hand? Why the forehead? Well, the forehead goes back to that mark in Ezekiel, except this is a mark that's not in league with God, it's in league with Satan. The mark on the hand, why there? That's where you mark slavery. You're not a slave, but you, you put a mark on that right hand, you're a slave to the Antichrist. That's what you're bowing to. So the mark of the beast was all about who you worship. And this arrangement right here told the whole story to the Ephesians because the buying and selling happened in here. And in order to get in here, you had to burn a pinch, burn, burn a pinch of incense here to these guys. And if you didn't do it, you were automatically persecuted, automatically boycotted because you didn't worship the god Caesar. And basically you're bringing the, the wrath of the deity down upon you. And in that case of the Antichrist, you know as well as I do as you read the Bible, he is more than capable of doing some horrendous things. This is why this is a great place to talk about the mark of the beast. What it will be ultimately, maybe it's a visible symbol or maybe it's just the fact of who you worship and who you declare you won't during that time. But this is where it's, the story is told, right here where you're standing. And I just thought you'd like to know. Amen.